Welcome to another episode of Forage Focus with Christine Gelly. Christine Gelly is a extension educator with the Ohio State University Extension Program in Noble County. And today, Christine's going to be talking about alternative forages. So stay tuned. Alternative forages is a term we've been using at Ohio State for a couple of years. And when we say alternative forages, what we're really implying there is that these forages can be used in non-traditional ways to either extend the growing season or give more opportunities to harvest a forage crop. A alternative forage is simply one that is different from your normal management system and we will discuss a variety of alternative forages that can be used to accomplish those goals. The inspiration for this episode's topic came from a recent invitation to an alternative forages field day, where I gave a presentation speaking on the use of various alternative forages. So I've adapted that presentation for your viewing today. First, let's talk about what is an alternative forage. When I was contemplating this term, I came up with a few different ideas of what the definition would be. When I think of alternative forages, these crops are ones that break the mold. They are non-traditional when we compare what we typically have in the state of Ohio, which are cool season perennial grass mixes that we manage for either hay or for pasture. But these are also inventive forages not in the invention of a new forage, although some may be, but rather the invention of a new idea, a new way to incorporate it on your farm and use it for your livestock. These are a component of a greater vision. Whether that greater vision is simply to extend the grazing season or to make more money at the end of the day, these are a component of a significant end goal. They are additions to either already successful programs or those that clearly need some improvements, but they are just one piece of a whole puzzle that we'll put together to fit the needs of our production system. And hopefully these forages will be considered problem solvers. They could be the solution to gaps in a current hay or a grazing program to help fill gaps like summer slump or to provide extended fall grazing or additional stored feed that you can produce on your own ground with equipment that you already have. Some examples of how we can incorporate alternative forages or alternative strategies include taking our old favorites and using them in new ways. This could include the conversion of a hay field into a pasture. It could be stockpiling more cool season forages, specifically tall fescue for fall or winter grazing. It could also include grazing crop residue. We often leave nutritional value on the field after we harvest a crop that could be consumed by livestock. There's also many annuals that we can consider for various growing seasons. We have a multitude of both warm season and cool season or summer and winter annuals that could be incorporated either as grazing, hay, or as cover crops or a combination. We also have the option of including warm season perennials. Warm season perennials do take quite a bit of consideration and planning to add to a system, but can provide long-term benefits. All in all, we are trying to be prepared for extreme changes that are difficult to foresee. These could include extreme changes in weather, business or family structure that impacts the farm, or changes in the market. The more versatility we have on the farm to adapt our system to changes, the more resilient we will be to the changes that come along. As we take a look at those warm season forages, let's identify some of the things that make them different in comparison to our traditional cool season grasses that are most commonly used here in Ohio. Our warm season forages have a C4 photosynthesis process of creating energy. This makes them more efficient during drought and heat 
they also have a different optimum growth range. Optimum growth for these forages is reached when the temperatures fall between 80 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit. These are quickly maturing forages, which means once the temperature hits that ideal range, they will mature quickly with rapid growth as well as reaching seed production more quickly. They also have higher water use efficiencies, which means they can create more biomass, more dry matter, more grazable material in a quicker time frame with less water than our cool season forages. Quickly, we'll take a look at some of the most commonly used native warm season perennial grasses for grazing in our part of the United States. The first is big blue stem. Big blue stem is commonly used in mixtures with the next forage that we will see. Indian grass has very similar growth requirements and attributes to big blue stem, hence they are commonly used in mixtures together. Big blue stem and Indian grass are also the most palatable to beef cattle and other livestock when we compare them to the others, which means that you'll have better weight gain when grazing big blue stem and Indian grass when compared to switchgrass and eastern gamma grass, which we'll see next. Switchgrass is a dual purpose plant. It can be used both for forage as well as for biofuel production. Switchgrass is more competitive than Indian grass and big blue stem when used in a stand. However, the palatability of switchgrass is lower and animal intake is usually affected. It does take an acclimation time to get animals used to switchgrass but once intake picks up, nutritional value is good as well as weight gain. Eastern gamma grass is another type of native warm season grass with excellent drought tolerance and gamma grass is the most tolerant of these for waterlogged conditions. So it has the advantage of surviving through flood as well as drought, which can be very helpful in many situations. All of these forages share the same advantages. They require little fertilization and can survive, persist, and produce with little water while still providing high outputs, which includes both above and below ground dry matter. So we're talking about roots as well as leaves. They're also adapted to our region. So we don't have very many issues with pests, pathogens, or weather conditions. From my standpoint, the greatest advantage of our native warm season perennials, as well as other warm season grasses um, and legumes, is that they fill our gap for summer slump. As you can see in the graph displayed, we have a light green bar that shows the growth habits of our cool season grasses. We see high output of growth from our cool seasons in spring, then production reduces during the summer and then picks up again in the fall when the temperature ranges and moisture conditions are most suitable. In contrast, for our darker green bar on the graph, we can see that production from our warm season grasses is pretty well the opposite. We see growth pick up right at the beginning of summer and fall again with the onset of autumn. In a situation where we have both available, we can provide more feed that is grazable or harvestable for hay throughout the growing season and combat that time when our cool season forages tend to go dormant due to heat and low moisture. Of course, along with the advantages, there are some disadvantages, or we could paraphrase and call them challenges. That first challenge is that there's not a lot of variety available on the market when it comes to selecting seed. These types of forages haven't been rapidly improved because they've been less popular throughout the years. So it can be more challenging to find seed that is specifically adapted for your location. However, we already know that since these grasses are native through almost the entire eastern part of North America, we shouldn't have challenges with adaptation to our site, but there's not a lot of variety out there to choose from. Establishment is probably the most glaring challenge of incorporating warm season perennial grasses our natives especially, they're slow to establish. But also the seed is quite small. So getting your seed bed prepared appropriately is crucial before you actually put the seed into the ground. 
When our seed is small, we have to be more careful about delicate placement into the soil profile to get appropriate germination. And then also because these grasses have a bunch type growth habit, it takes a long time for the grasses to actually expand and fill in the space in the pasture. You should allocate about three years to get good establishment of a native warm season grass pasture. And that is primarily because the first years of growth, energy is primarily allocated to root growth. And that extensive root system put on by our native grasses is what makes them adventitious through extreme weather conditions, adaptable to grazing as well as hay, and gives us the longevity of the stand, which could last for decades. However, we have to be patient at the beginning to allow those root systems to really establish. And after the roots are established, we'll see that above ground growth pick up and fill in those bunches. But be prepared for the stand to look patchy the first three years as those plants expand out from their first tillers and fill in the gaps between rows. Because that establishment time is slow, it's really important to also pay attention to weed competition in the early years so that we are getting our nutrients allocated to the plants we're trying to grow and not to weeds. Now, when it comes to forage quality, if we compare cool season and warm season forages side by side, cool seasons do have a higher nutritive value. However, they're not always available when we're trying to get through that droughty part of summer. So having a lower quality forage that is available is certainly helpful when the alternative is not having enough forage to graze. Our animal intakes are a hurdle that we need to jump. We need to adapt our animals to grazing these types of forages. And it will show that the animals are eating less of that forage than if they were grazing cool season grasses. And one of the reasons for those lower animal intakes are the amount of fiber that's accumulated in warm season grasses. So they stay fuller, longer, digestive time is extended with warm season grasses. So we won't see them consuming as many pounds of forage when we're grazing warm seasons versus cool seasons. Our warm season forages do require us to pay more attention during grazing on how we adjust animal units per area. And what I'm saying there is that growth can pick up rapidly with these forages where we may need to put more animals on a smaller area to control growth and move them more quickly throughout our rotations. So growth can pick up rapidly and cause some challenges of keeping it under control and not getting too over mature. And we really need to be aware of grazing too closely, which is more of a problem than having it get ahead of us. If we graze our warm season natives too closely, we damage the apical meristem, which is the primary growth point on the plant. And that can cause very slow regeneration, slower tillering, and overall can harm our root system. So we want to be aware that close grazing is a concern and not graze those grasses below eight to six inches. Aside from our native perennial grasses, there are also introduced warm season perennials that have been successfully used in Ohio. Two of them are Caucasian bluestem and Bermuda grass. Although Bermuda grass has not consistently performed well, there have been some producers with successful stands. Caucasian bluestem is more adapted to our region. It's a bunch type grass. It provides good yields and good quality and performs well on reclaimed sites. It does propagate itself by seed. It is fine stemmed, so it has decent palatability. Um, however, produces less dry matter than our native perennials we were speaking of before. And then Bermuda grass is often used in lawns in the Mid-South, and we're right on the border of its successful range. It's a creeping perennial grass, so it forms a, a thick, dense mat of forage more quickly than our bunch types. It provides good quality forage. It's also drought tolerant, but it's that winter hardiness that tends to be a problem for us in Ohio. We don't have good varieties available that consistently persist through most of the state 
uh, during our winter times. So there are areas where it's been successful, but I don't widely recommend it. But if you're looking for a new challenge, maybe you could try a stand of Bermuda grass. Our warm season annual grasses are much more user friendly, especially for those starting out in their grazing systems. And if you have less land space available, you can frequently change what you're growing and when, when you utilize annuals. So some examples of warm season annual grasses that I provided for you today include our forage sorghums, our sorghum Sudan grass hybrids, which we often call Sudex, Sudan grass, pearl millet, and crabgrass. What I did not include on the slide is teff grass. It's another annual warm season grass that produces fine textured forage. All of these will die in winter. They would need to be planted at the end of May or early June, depending on our soil temperatures, and they will complete all of their growth before first frost. After we get a hard killing frost, these will die out, leaving you with a blank space to start with something new. They could be a good crop to use in the midst of converting a pasture from one species to another, cropland to pasture, pasture to cropland. They can be used as cover crops. They could also be utilized as emergency forage. Through Ohio State, we have multiple resources available on the different types of grasses available here. And I highly suggest them for those who are starting out branching into alternative forages and looking into bridging that summer slump gap with a short-term commitment. This is just a commitment for one season. When we look at our perennials, we have a much more long-term approach that can be a little intimidating, but here with our annual grasses, you have a lot of flexibility and more room to try things in a shorter time frame. If you have additional questions about the grasses listed here on the screen, please reach out or investigate more information about those on our Forages website, which is forages.osu.edu. Some examples of these annual grasses growing in the field. At the top of the slide, you'll see there a sorghum Sudan grass hybrid, and that stand as you see it is about six foot tall, and it still has not gone to seed. So we can get a lot of dry matter in a very short period of time. I believe that photo was taken at the beginning of July, and the stand would have been planted at the beginning of June. So about 60 days growth in that photo. And then towards the bottom of the screen, what you see is a variety of crabgrass that has been developed for grazing systems. This variety is called Red River, and you can see that these Angus heifers are happy and they have plenty to graze in a three acre paddock for about six heifers. When we look at warm season legumes, we do have some options that are perennials. The most common perennial warm season legume would be Ceresia lesbidiza. Ceresia lesbidiza is often grown on reclaimed or marginal sites. Its intake is low. It's not very palatable for livestock because of the tannins that occur inside the plant. However, those tannins have a benefit as well which is reducing the pressure of parasitism in small ruminants. We have found through research though that it takes a high amount of Ceresia lesbidiza to have that effect, and the best way to feed it to actually see reductions in parasite loads is pelletalized and fed in a feed bunk. So it can be difficult to adapt animals to graze it, but it is one of our options. Other perennial legumes that are warm seasons usually don't make it through our Ohio winters, and that's why they're not displayed on the chart here. Most of them would be considered annuals in Ohio. When we look at some of the commonly used annuals, we have an annual lesbidiza that is very similar to our perennial, except it requires reseeding every year, gives you some more flexibility. Cowpea is one that's often incorporated into cover crop mixes. It has good nutritional value, does well during drought and on marginal sites too. And then soybean. We often don't think of soybean as being a forage, but it was actually introduced as forage for livestock originally. There are forage type soybeans that can be grown either for grazing or for haylage or silage. Soybean does not dry down very well, so it's difficult to make hay, but it can be green chopped and fed, it can be ensiled, 
or it could be grazed. Another one that is sometimes incorporated with native warm season grass plantings is called partridge pea. Partridge pea is a legume. However, we don't recommend it a lot for cattle because it does have some issues with digestive upset and can cause intake issues. So partridge pea may be very beneficial for wildlife in general, but it's not recommended as a grazed forage. Many of our annual crops that we recommend in Ohio are promoted as cover crops. And in the chart on the screen, we've shown this before in an episode of Forage Focus, is a list of common cover crops used in Ohio. And in this chart, you'll see them specified with their value as a grazed crop, as well as as a harvested crop. You can take a look at this chart to pick out the ones that seem most valuable to you and then look up additional information. The ratings for these range from fair to excellent. So whether you intend to graze or you intend to harvest the forage, you can sort through those that are most appealing to you. If we're considering a small grain as one of our alternative forages, there's some advice I have for you here. Most likely you're going to be planting those in late summer or early fall. When we look at harvesting them or grazing them, we want to do that before they enter the heading stage. Early boot is appropriate in most cases. You can begin grazing our annual small grains once they reach six inches, leaving a three inch stubble if you intend to come back and graze again. Note that if you graze them all the way to the ground, they're less likely to come back for that spring growth. Of course, you don't have to start grazing at six inches. That's the minimum to start grazing. If you allow them more growth, you'll be able to spend more days on the site. Brassicas are an intriguing option for annual forage. The thing that appeals most to me about brassicas and recommending them for people in our region of Ohio here in the southeast is their adaptability to various soil acidities. When we look at the site requirements for brassicas, they can grow between the levels of 5.3 and 6.8. So we go from pretty acidic there to almost neutral. And that can be really helpful when you have a site that needs lime. We can incorporate brassicas for the short term or for the long term, providing quick grazable forage that provides really nice nutritive value. The biggest challenge with incorporating brassicas like turnips and radishes is their high water content. Most of these are up to 80% or more water and that will lead to rapid digestion and they will consume a lot of it very quickly. So stocking rate is definitely something to pay attention to with brassicas. They do not harvest well. You can green chop them, but these are ideal for grazing. Comparing many of our annual forages side by side, you can do that in this chart that's provided. It's available for print as well from the forages website. All the information comes from the Ohio Agronomy Guide. And what you'll see in this chart is advice for planting, appropriate planting dates, feed rates, planting depth, fertilizer needs, dry matter yields. These are, of course, estimates as well as estimates of crude protein and neutral detergent fiber, which is important when you're thinking about feeding these to your livestock. You can use this chart as well, along with the one provided previously to investigate more about incorporating some of these into your system. Next, I'll just provide you with some grazing tips for these annual forages. Strip grazing is often a good method for allowing animals access to the forage. It allows you to set the amount available to them, which is great for an acclimation period. You can incorporate temporary movable fence that is going to expand your options. You can gradually change the area available. You can speed up or slow down rotations by using that temporary fence. When we allow animals to strip graze, we can allow them to adjust slowly, distribute manure evenly across the landscape, we can also promote even foot traffic across the field when there's limited forage available. They're always moving forward. Strip grazing also allows us to fully utilize the space and consume as much forage as possible before moving on to the next site. If we intend to regraze the area, it is important to leave appropriate stubble 
for regrowth and also to limit back grazing. So pay attention to where your water is located in the field to set up those rotationally grazed paddocks. Of course, when utilizing temporary fence, it's important to have an exterior permanent fence around the location to make sure our animals stay secure in the event of an electric failure. We also wanna make sure we keep fresh water and free choice mineral available at all times and provide additional high fiber forage to help slow down the passage rate and improve overall digestion when we switch our animals to a new feed. Just as we speak about with our cool season perennial grasses, we need to find the balance point between forage maturity and quality. We know that the younger the forage is, the more palatable and nutritious it is to our livestock. However, we won't get enough yield to make grazing or harvest worthwhile. So we need to balance the nutritional value as well as the yield to get best results. Maximum yield does not equal best quality and best quality does not equal maximum yield. So which one is more important to you? I pose the question, quality or yield? I hope that it's quality and we need to find that yield that makes it worthwhile to graze or harvest because what good is a plethora of poor quality forage? We wanna make sure that what we're offering is worth eating. So we need to manage for both quality and quantity at all times with all of our forages. If you find yourself foraging for more forage information, I encourage you to visit and follow these pages available from Ohio State. We have a forages website and many articles are posted both on our beef team webpage and our sheep team webpage that can help you work toward the direction of improving your grazing or hay systems. We sure have covered a lot today in our episode of Forage Focus, and it's likely brought up some new questions and considerations. If you have questions or comments that you would like to address, please feel free to reach out to me, Christine Gelly from OSU Extension. My direct business line is displayed on the screen as well as my email, and you can check out our many episodes of Forage Focus on the playlist provided or by scanning the QR code. We hope to catch you next time on another edition of Forage Focus. Thank <music> you.